I want to talk about the BBC and how they are whitewashing the very real and extensive Nazi threat that has grown in Ukraine over the last eight years and was one of the contributing factors to Russia finally acting and moving into Ukraine to neutralize this threat. Uh, I want to show you this from the BBC outside source. March 23rd, 2022, it was presented by a guy called Ross Atkins. You cannot watch it unless you're in the UK. So I actually had someone uh, record it with their phone in their hotel room. So bear with me, the quality is, is very bad. And I, I could wait for a higher quality version, but I don't know when that will happen. So I'm just gonna do this now and show you. Please just bear with me. And uh, if a better version comes along, I will put the link in the video description below. But I'm going to show you how everything that they, they say now, the BBC says now about Azov Battalion, how they're, they're not really a big threat and not, there are no real Nazi problems in Ukraine. I'm going to show you how the BBC themselves and the last eight years, the BBC themselves completely debunks everything Ross Atkins and the BBC is saying right now about Nazis in Ukraine. So let's listen to Ross Atkins lie to our face about how there are no Nazis in Ukraine and how Russia is just making it up. Let's listen. Good fighters in 2014, and they seem to be pretty good fighters now in Mariupol. That's why they were taken on the books. And in 2014, with Russia backing separatists, urgent military considerations trumped all others. Ukraine was under attack, and its then president, Petro Poroshenko, called us off our best warriors. But when in 2015 he was asked by the BBC about the group's far-right links, his reply was blunt. Please, don't taste the Russian propaganda. So what are, first of all, what are they doing? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're they're going to say that they're not Nazis, but even if they are Nazis, this is the, the reason that it's okay to use Nazis. So they're trying to cover all of their bases, which is something the BBC does frequently. And they, they did the same thing in regards to Syria when people were starting to realize, oh wait, no, they're not freedom fighters. They're Al Qaeda and ISIS that the US is backing in Syria. I, they did the same thing here in Thailand. They, they say that the protesters are peaceful, but if they're not peaceful, this is the reason why them being violent is okay. So this is a, this is a very a well-established tactic the BBC uses. Let's, let's listen to some more. Russia has used Azov in its propaganda for years. And as we assess claims about Azov's role in Ukraine, context is vital here. Ukraine's armed forces total 250,000 plus 50,000 National Guard. Azov is part of the National Guard with around a thousand volunteer fighters. It's a tiny fraction of the Ukrainian military. They're not going to tell you what their source is. If you read the Western media, by 2017, you had publications already claiming that Azov fighters stood at 3,000. Now, there is a battle taking place right now in Mariupol as I'm recording this. There are over 10,000 Russian troops and, and uh, from Donetsk, fighters from Donetsk, encircling and moving into the city. Uh, they're going to admit that the main force fighting back and defending Mariupol is Azov. And we also know from reading and watching the, the Western media over the last month that there are Azov units operating all over Ukraine in every major city, in Kiev, in Kharkov, in Lvov, and everywhere in between. So how is it that a, just there's only a thousand of them, according to the BBC, and yet they're they're holding out against over 10,000 Russian troops in Mariupol, and they're also leading military operations everywhere from Kiev to Kharkov to Lvov. How is that possible? And it's possible if the BBC is just simply lying, and there are many more thousand fighters in Azov than we're being told. And, and it's because what they're trying to do is say they're not Nazis, but even if there are Nazis, it's a very small number of Nazis, which is not a valid argument. If a government sees a formation of Nazis, even if it's just a thousand strong, and they decide to officially incorporate them into their armed forces, now the entire government and the armed forces is complicit in aiding, abetting, empowering, arming, funding, and training Nazis, that they incorporated them into their organization knowingly and willingly, and now they are complicit in Nazism. So it doesn't matter how many there are. And, but what they're trying to do is say, it's just a small number. So there's, there's context to this. It's nuanced, it's not nuanced. The, the Ukrainian government knowingly 
and willfully incorporated Nazis into their armed forces that taints the entire regime. The entire regime and the armed forces are all tainted because of that. Ima imagine if the United States had a, a battalion of Nazis uh, operating inside their armed forces. Uh, would we look the, Would we be able to look the other way? And the answer is no, we wouldn't be able to. That would be a stain on the entire country and no one should be able to sleep until that stain is scrubbed off. And the same goes for Ukraine. And uh, the BBC is just making an exception for this because it's politically expedient. It's politically expedient to support Nazis in Ukraine because right now they're fighting Russia. They're tying up Russia, they're killing Russians. So this is why they're supporting it. Just like they supported Al Qaeda and ISIS for years and years in Syria, lied about them, lied about the true nature of these so-called moderate rebels until it became impossible to lie about them any further. It's also not the same force as it was in 2014. The Azov are recruitment. Azov opened its recruitment to the whole of Ukrainian society, and eventually this radical call was drowned out by the mass of newcomers who joined the regiment because it was an elite unit. And while the membership was evolving, the founder also left to start a new far-right political party, a party which has failed to achieve any electoral success. But the Azov regiment that he left behind is high profile and mainstream. This is the view of the Ukrainian government. The only Nazi elements we have on the territory of Ukraine now are the Russian fascist army. In the last few days, President Zelensky announced that Azov's commander in Mariupol will receive the highest national military award. But despite its acclaim, despite the evolving membership, questions about neo-Nazi links remain. In January, BuzzFeed's Christopher Miller reported that he'd seen an Azov veteran wearing white supremacists and Nazi symbols. There is though no evidence such sentiment is widespread. Again, this is a complete lie. Azov Battalion operates under a literal Nazi flag. So if they truly reformed and they were not the same group of nasty, violent Nazis that they were in 2014, uh, how come they kept the Nazi flag? How hard is it to change a flag? It's not, it's not hard at all. Uh, so this is again the BBC uh, bringing in experts who are just lying to your, you know experts lying to your face and saying that no it, they're not Nazis anymore they might have been Nazis but they aren't Nazis anymore and uh, here is the BBC as recently as 2018 explaining how Azov are nothing but a bunch of violent Nazis. The national militia are part of a group called Azov, initially a volunteer military battalion. It has well-established links to the far right. Its founder, this man Andrei Biletsky, has in the past expressed racist and anti-Semitic views. And its logo has clear Nazi overtones. Uh, my favorite quote uh, from Andrei Biletsky is that uh, the destiny of the Ukrainian nation is to be an avant-garde in holy war of white people against under humans led by Semites. Beletsky now denies he ever said that. But as this oath-making ceremony shows, he's not running away from the dubious imagery. Azov has now started a political party, as well as launching the national militia. So let's continue. Here's Vitaly Shevchenko from BBC Monitoring. I was looking at the Azov Battalion's social media activity and its website, and um, all they talk about is fighting the uh, Russian forces, and there's very little in terms of um, extremist, um, anti-migrant or uh, xenophobic rhetoric there. And so it is this Azov regiment that is part of Ukraine's resistance. So that is also an absolute lie. And uh, there was a very notorious slip up by Azov battalion specifically. Check this out. This is from Al Jazeera. Ukrainian fighters grease bullets against Chechen with Chechens with pig fat. A video shared by National Guard of Ukraine shows Azov fighters dipping bullets to be used against Muslim Chechen fighters in pig fat. This was late February 2022. And here is the official Twitter account of the National Guard of Ukraine. It's a Ukraine government organization, according to Twitter. And according to Twitter, it violates Twitter's rules about hateful conduct. So Twitter is admitting that this is hateful conduct, even though the uh, the so-called expert 
at the BBC said they he didn't see any of this. So Azov fighters of the National Guard greased the bullets with lard against Kadrov orcs. And he's talking about Chechen fighters uh, in the Russian military. And so the BBC is just lying to you. They're just blatantly lying to you. They're, they're saying, I didn't see any of this. It, it's right there. It's right there on the official National Guard of Ukraine uh, Twitter account. Them uh, engaging in racist, bigoted, hateful, uh, xenophobic behavior. This is all they have done since they got into power in 2014. This is all they have done, and it is what they continue to do to this day. And the only reason you're not hearing about it is because the BBC and others across the Western media are covering it up. And at the same time, they're deleting people like me off of Twitter and many others off of Twitter, off of Facebook, off of YouTube. I'm sure I'll be off of YouTube here very soon. They're going to delete these people off so that they can't point out that they're lying to you. And just as in 2014, its focus is the Donbass region. That includes the two breakaway republics and the city of Mariupol. It is close to the Sea of Azov, which gives the regiment its name. It's also where Azov made its name. Back in 2014, Azov successfully defended the city as Mariupol is bombarded by the Russians now, alongside other Ukrainian forces. It's trying to do so again. And I just want to point out that clip where he showed uh, Azov fighters training, that's actually from an earlier BBC report where they were talking about how they're Nazis. It also has a reputation for having a hard right-wing nationalist ideology. In fact, it's been accused of having neo-Nazis in its ranks. So it's just, it's ridiculous. What, what the BBC is doing right now is just lying straight to your face and hoping you're, you're too dumb and disinterested to even just look at the BBC's own reporting on Azov over the last eight years. And Azov's presence in Mariupol once more makes it central to Russia's false narratives. You'll remember the horror of Russia bombing a maternity hospital in the city. Afterwards, the Russians said this. <laughs> At the UN Security Council, facts were proffered by our delegation saying that the maternity hospital had been taken over by Azov Battalion and other radicals. But there's no evidence Azov were based there, no evidence it was a military facility. Then there's Russia's attack on a theatre in Mariupol that was sheltering civilians. Russia accuses Azov of doing this. There's absolutely no evidence this is true. And there's also absolutely no evidence that it's not true because it's Ukraine saying one thing and Russia saying another thing. And so the BBC is using two completely unverified stories to prove that Russia's doing propaganda and, and that they must also be doing propaganda about Azov, which as you should be seeing by now, the BBC itself over the last eight years has admitted are Nazis and a growing threat to Ukraine. This isn't Russia saying it, it's the BBC who this guy works for saying that over the last eight years and now he's trying to convince you that you didn't just hear that for the last eight years uh, this is what's actually going on there are no nazis and if anyone says otherwise it's russian propaganda so i guess russia was running the bbc for the last eight years and now finally they've gotten control back and so while any azov volunteers having nazi sympathies is shocking and worthy of note Neo-Nazis are not the threat that Russia describes, but perhaps this is not about an actual threat, and rather about something else entirely. The New York Times writes of how the word Nazi appears geared towards Russians, for whom remembrance of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany remains perhaps the single most powerful element of a unifying national identity. Completely irrelevant, and again, they're just trying to advance the, this new narrative that Azov are, aren't Nazis, they aren't a threat, and Russia is just making this up, and that they're directing this toward the Russian audiences. But as I've pointed out, over the last eight years, the Western media has been reporting on this growing threat of Nazis in Ukraine, and how it didn't just threaten Ukraine, but it threatened the, re the rest of the Western world, because Ukraine was becoming a, a focal point for right-wing extremists from across the Western world. They were all going to Ukraine because it was cool to be an open Nazi in Ukraine. They were being incorporated into the armed forces. And uh, this was all reported on by the Western media for the late last eight years. And now this guy is going to tell you all of that is just Russian propaganda. Putin is looking to the past to create motivation in the present. This is the historian, Shane O'Rourke. 
what the regime is doing is using the memory of the war, the very deep feelings it arouses, to legitimize its actions, not just in Ukraine, but, but in many other places as well. Again, they're just blatantly lying to you, straight to your face. Uh, they don't care that they have been, they themselves have been reporting on this for the last eight years. They're, they're going to tell you now that it's not true because it's politically expedient. This is all the BBC does. They're not journalists. They are propagandists. It's all pure projection onto Russia. Oh, Russia is lying about why they went into Ukraine. No, actually, the BBC is. Because for the last eight years, the BBC and Russian media admitted that there was a growing Nazi threat in Ukraine. Putin has his reasons to do this. But he doesn't have the facts. Just after Russia's invasion, 150 historians who study genocide, Nazism and World War II released a statement. In it, they argue this rhetoric is factually wrong, morally repugnant and deeply offensive to the memory of millions of victims of Nazism and those who courageously fought against it. The rhetoric is factually wrong. Nazis don't hold Ukraine hostage. They're not launching attacks on Ukrainians. Patently untrue. The BBC, again, the, their report showed these Nazis literally holding a whole group of politicians hostage until they voted the way they wanted them to. The National Militia have already been flexing their muscles in Ukrainian politics. This is the city hall in the town of Cherkasy. Look at it now. All around the outside are security officers. There are more police here today than there are representatives. And the reason the police have come is because at the last session, this happened. The National Militia, together with some war veterans, turned up and stood among the deputies, announcing that no one would leave until the mayor's budget was passed. <laughs> After some scuffles and angry exchanges, the budget was passed. Зараз Черкаси стала тренувальним майданчиком для військово-поверової роботи в Україні. Alarmist, perhaps, but many people, not just in Cherkasy, are wondering whether the national militia are being mobilized as part of a bigger political play. This is him, Arsen Avakov, Ukraine's ambitious interior minister. His links to the Azov group are well known. He's put their fighters on the payroll of his ministry and appointed one of their commanders, Vadim Troyan, as his deputy. And they have, for the last eight years, by the BBC's own admission, been killing ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine for the last eight years. The BBC themselves have reported this. And now he's telling you that's not true. Ukrainians don't need liberating from Nazis. To their president, this idea is pure fiction. It's already the 25th day of the Russian military trying in vain to find imaginary Nazis from whom they allegedly want to defend our people, just as they're trying in vain to find Ukrainians who would greet them with flowers. That search will continue to be in vain because while the evolution of the Azov regiment deserves scrutiny, neo-Nazis in the far right do not play the role in Ukraine that Russia falsely describes. They didn't in 2014, they don't now. And yet the BBC themselves back in 2014 admitted that uh, these Nazis were the most organized, and they were the most effective. They were the ones who were fighting the police and they are ultimately the ones who violently ran the government out of power in 2014. And they have been doing this ever since. But the most organized and perhaps the most effective were a small number of far right groups. When it came to confrontations with the police, it was often the nationalists who were the loudest and the most violent. A group calling itself the Right Sector is perhaps the largest. Its members can be seen marching around Kiev in columns of about a dozen. Mostly they carry baseball bats. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they carry guns. They reported 
on these Nazis killing Ukrainian police and soldiers, not in Eastern Ukraine, where they were killing ethnic Russians, but in Western Ukraine over differences in political opinions and their use of force to get their way. That, that is the BBC reporting that. Its members are more motivated than Ukraine's conscripted regular army, and the government relies on them to bolster their strength. Now they're flexing their muscles. In recent weeks, the right sector has been involved in firefights with Ukrainian security forces in the west of the country, hundreds of miles from the front line. These clashes in Mukachevo, on the border with the European Union, were about control of lucrative smuggling routes, but it was also a show of force, a signal from a strong militia to a weak government. Don't cross us. The BBC also went in with these extremists into the offices of opposition parties that they violently ran out of Ukraine and, and took over their offices. We got a late night phone call from another group known as C-14, inviting us to meet their leader at their new base. It turned out to be the former headquarters of the Communist Party, now occupied by the far right. It's our general mission to totally ruin uh, chains that uh, connect our country with the uh, imperial uh, power uh, from the past. And they, they would ask them, you know, are you Nazis? And they would say, we're not Nazis, we're nationalists. We just hate Jews and Russians. Are you a Nazi? Uh, no, I don't think I'm a Nazi. I'm a Ukrainian nationalist. And what does that mean? The main confrontation is uh, about that some ethnic groups uh, have uh, control uh, many business structures, some economic, some political forces, and uh, which ethnic groups? Uh, 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 Russians and Jews and the Poles. It maybe uh, every some uh, non-Ukrainian group control a huge percent of some economic or political uh, power. And uh, of course, in this situation, uh, Ukrainian people have uh, some uh, tension between it and it causes uh, conflicts. I mean, they're not because they're Nazis. And so they've been playing this game from the very beginning. And in many ways, the BBC helped them, even though at the time they sort of revealed it and exposed it and reported on it. But at the same time, uh, just a year later, they would be saying that, no, they, they, there weren't any fascists involved in the Euro Maiden, even though the BBC was there with them during the Euro Maiden. So there's this pattern of the BBC covering something as it's happening, and then when it becomes politically inconvenient to bring this up, as there are repercussions for Nazis being involved in the Euro Maiden, or Nazis being the trigger that bring Russia into Ukraine, they want to erase that from history. And so that's what Ross Atkins is doing. He's trying to erase history that the BBC itself helped document and report on and inform their audiences of. And now he's trying to rewrite a new narrative where as a battalion are just patriots, there's nothing to do with Nazis, even though they operate literally under a Nazi flag and wear Nazi insignia on their uniforms and that anyone saying otherwise are Russian propagandists, which I guess it also includes uh, the entirety of the BBC's reporting over the last eight years. We have to work very hard because as you can see, this is a very uphill battle. They're going to continue to lie. They're going to lie about things they themselves have reported on for the last eight years. And, and you can see how aggressive they are now deleting and erasing people off of the internet who are calling them out on their lies, this, this pattern of lying that they have done for so long, not just in regards to Ukraine, but in regards to everything, going all the way back to uh, the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the, the bombing and destruction of Libya in 2011, the destruction, invasion, and occupation of Syria from 2011 onward, the, the conflict in Yemen, and now, Ukraine, they're doing it again, and they're doing it more aggressively than ever, and they are using this conflict as a springboard to go after China. And when it becomes China's turn, there will be no room for anyone left on social media, uh, on YouTube, on all of these platforms. Google is going to just delete you from their search index. You will not exist on the Western 
uh, media. So we need to start migrating people away from Western media, away from Western platforms online. We need to start building a community beyond their reach. And that, that does actually mean using pr platforms created by Russia, by China, by other countries, specifically because for years they have seen this threat evolving and they created solutions to counter it. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share it, subscribe to my channel. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please uh, see where you can find my work elsewhere. In the video description below, you will see the link to Odyssey and uh, Rumble. Those are two backup channels that I have. All of my videos are automatically uploaded there. Please start following that. In case I get deleted off of YouTube, that's where I will be. I'm also on Telegram. I update that on a very regular basis. I'm using that instead of Twitter because I was deleted off of Twitter. And uh, I don't really use Facebook. I am on VK, which is Russia's version of Facebook. And I'm also on Weibo, which is Chinese social media. So look for me in all of those places. Uh, and to everyone who has been helping me support my work, whether it's month to month or one-time donations using Buy Me A Coffee, or Patreon, or PayPal, thank you so much. Or if you're just sending me news tips, or kind words, or helping share my work with others, thank you so much. I could not do this without that help. And as always, thank you for watching.